The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all. Welcome to our section uh, in the, our mega event of LIFMA and FMCC on World FM Day 2000. Uh, Sorry, 2015, 17. Uh, today, I, we, are, we are having the presentation of FM Standard Hit the International Stage. Uh, from from uh, live from Unique United Kingdom and Sydney, uh, Stan Mitchell, Dave Wilson, and Stephen Bastry. This is uh, well, well, the logistics for this presentation. The polls will be used uh, in the webinar, uh, questions in, uh, at the end of the presentation. And what we will have a quick survey and the conclusion of the webinar. This webinar uh, is recorded and will be available online in FM system website. This is the vision for the FMCC. The FMCC is a consulting group for IFMA uh, and our mission statement. We, uh, we, uh, we can help uh, in the ASCA expert online education research and find a uh, consultant and locate a speaker. Our sponsors, a good sponsor in ESNS and Greg Moore and their team and service sponsors, GFMA and ESTAR. This is a World FM day that starts yesterday and uh, we, uh, with uh, a starting presentation in this uh, after, uh, afternoon in, the, in our timeline. This World FM day uh, have a, a uh, uh, present for for our virtual concert for uh, FMCC Consultant Council. And we will have more than a 30, 30, 38 uh, uh, sections in, in this three days, the mega sections. This we can have, we can see all the speakers that we have in this time and for the outer world, people that are, are, are making these presentations. In the, in the beginning for today, we have Stan Misha, CEO of the Key Facilities Management International, and Chair of the ISO PC267 uh, Facility Management, facility management uh, Standard. David Wilson, if you may follow, its owner, Effective Facilities uh, Limited, is the almost uh, almost uh, if uh, is ISO TC two two six seven uh, a UK nominated expert. And Stephen Stephen Ballastri is a director and head of his advisory and reader at Lefton and book now. It's always uh, ISO TC two six seven Australian nominated expert. This objective for today is understand how the co uh, consensus based on approach to standards development the benefits of the sector. Uh, learning how to publish standards can be applied to your organization. Learn about the uh, upcoming management system standard and accreditation as a methodology and approach to the management strategies within uh, every organization. Learn how you can become involved in development of future FM standard. The agenda today is an overview uh, of the ISO TC group and uh, the facilities mentioned, uh, review, review published standards so far, and review uh, ISO uh, 41001DES uh, facilities mentioned. Uh, system records with guidance for use and how to get involved on this. Now, 
Let's start the presidential request for Levin. It's yours. Uh, just a moment, everyone. Let me get the right screen for you all. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, we're going to start the presentation with Stan Mitchell this morning and this evening. Okay, th thank you, Levine um, Navern. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, IFMA FM Consultants Council for the kind invitation uh, to Dave, Stephen, and myself uh, in order to uh, bring you all up to date with what's happening around the ISO standards. Um, what we are going to do is run through uh, where we have come from, uh, where we are, and uh, where we are going, uh, so that those of you listening to the webinar are fully informed, and also we will be advising you how you can get involved. So uh, to start at the beginning, um, the ISO Technical Committee uh, was established, as it says on that slide, in 2011. And it was established on the back of the good work that had been done in Europe in terms of the European standards. And you'll hear a little bit more about those uh, later on in this presentation. For some people uh, involved in the FM world, which is, tends to be a very uh, busy, active uh, world that we all live in, um, you might ask the question, why do we bother to try and create uh, international FM standards? Um, for many, many years now, um, a lot of us uh, have commented about facilities management and its lack of recognition as a strategic professional discipline. And for many of us who uh, had those comments and thoughts over the years, um, we decided to try and do something about it. Um, you have organizations like IFMA and others around the world who try to create standards and, and knowledge and information. Uh, but in order to try and get the recognition, A, worldwide, and B, across uh, the C-suite in organizations and governments across the world, uh, the neutral body that has the respect and the kudos um, in terms of international standards, uh, tends to be the, the ISO organization. So back in 2011, we decided the time was right to uh, try and elevate the good work that had been done in Europe and build on it and uh, make sure that it, was, it would work for the rest of the international community. So uh, we kicked that off using the two, the first two international European standards uh, and elevated them up to ISO level. Um, and as we'll explain in a moment, um, that is a, a quite lengthy and robust process that, that we have to go through. So the, the purpose of creating uh, ISO international standards in FM is to raise the bar, to raise the profile and most importantly, to uh, make sure that there is a consensus amongst ourselves in terms of the language we use, the approach that we take, et cetera. So as this slide indicates, it's around the introduction of general requirements for facilities management in terms of organizational strategies. Uh, our aim is to try and articulate some of those requirements in order to improve and affect uh, efficient and effective uh, management regime and, and teams that work for us. And also to provide guidance um, so that those emerging markets can learn from the, the mistakes and the successes in other markets that are maybe perhaps further down that journey um, 
and hopefully uh, accelerate and, and leapfrog their development in, in terms of effective and efficient facilities management for their own organizations or the clients that they work for. So how do we go about that? Um, as you can see from the bottom of this slide, uh, the ISO organization itself has uh, 165 national standards bodies uh, within different countries, and that number uh, continues to grow. So within every uh, country, every geographical location, you have a national standards body, and that body belongs to uh, the International Standards Organization. Today, there are 238 technical committees, and ISO 267 for facility management is one of those technical committees. And as you can see below that, uh, ISO to date has published more than 21,000 standards. The standards are uh, technical and the standards are also uh, management, and we'll come on to explain a little bit about the differences to you in, in a moment. But the process of creating a standard is very much one of consensus. The reality is, and, and in the facility management world, I think we've all experienced that, whether it's within organizations or, or whether it's across geographical locations, we all have a different version of the truth as to what it is and how it should be done. So ISO standards is all about bringing those different uh, perceptions uh, and views on FM together so that we can try and A, learn from each other, but come to that consensus that we can all say, this is what FM is and this is how we take it forward. In doing so, those are those that get directly involved have to comply with the code of ethics, uh, which is quite robust and articulated. But having said that, um, in the process itself, it is totally open, transparent and impartial. And uh, part of what we need to do is, as a community, an FM community, is make sure that we are open to challenge and change and we learn from each other to come up with the best kind of standards that we can that can be applicable and utilised across the world. Uh, it supports the participation of developing countries. So um, those that have been directly involved in ISO 267 will absolutely recognise that um, any country can come along and add the value in terms of that process and what FM is or perhaps what FM should and could be in the future. And that directly influences the discussions that we have in order to create a standard. And the, at the end of the day, it's about the production of coherent, effective and uh, relevant standards that can be widely accepted, recognised and utilised uh, across the world. This uh, uh, slide gives you a view on the current state of ISO 267. Um, and the column on the left with the blue uh, indicator is the participating members. And there are 25 countries uh, at the moment. And slightly to the right of that, there are observing members. And the difference between the two is the participating members are the ones who are proactively participating in all of the work across every meeting that we have as a committee, whereas the observing members who perhaps don't have uh, experts that they can send to directly participate, at least observe and get copied in on the information and the, the documentation as we uh, progress the work across the various standards that we're working on. <coughs> So if you look at some of those countries, there are there is a very, very good mix internationally, and then you can see that from the map. But there is plenty of scope for many more countries to come on board, and, and we are getting inquiries on an ongoing basis. So we are hopeful that uh, the group, uh, the 42 countries, will grow uh, as we progress uh, and over time. If you look now at where we've had the meetings, uh, we try very hard to make sure that uh, we don't have the meetings in any one particular part of the world. And as you can see there, we have uh, deliberately held our meetings uh, in various continents uh, around the world, and, and we will continue to do so. Um, the next meeting is actually in 2017, is going to be in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. 
And what we also try to do for those people that do try to get involved and directly participate is we try and align our ISO meetings alongside uh, professional association conferences, exhibitions, etc., so that people who who travel uh, long distances around the world to participate get get some value back in terms of exposure to some some of these conferences and exhibitions, which of course are extremely valuable in terms of our knowledge and uh, the spread and the growth of FM uh, as a professional discipline. Uh, to show you now how the, the committee is uh, structured in terms of its leadership, when it, whenever we decide within ISO to create a standard, um, the process is that we create a working group. And if you look down uh, the column on the left-hand side of that slide, you will see working group one, two, uh, three, etc. And uh, you will also see from the people that have been involved as conv in convenorships that those working groups are led from people from different nationalities. And there is no prerequisite as to who takes on these roles. It's, a, it's on a voluntary basis. And if, obviously for those who participate in the meetings and are physically there are the ones that if they're happy to volunteer, they tend to be chosen. Um, but there is no limit as to who can lead and uh, what part of the world they come from. If you look at the bottom of that left-hand column, uh, you will see that we have, at our last meeting uh, earlier this year, we created two task groups. And one is to uh, look forward. And so we have a task group that's being led by Peter from uh, Austria. Um, to map out a roadmap as to what else do we need to be thinking about working on uh, when we the work on our current standards comes to a conclusion. Um, so Peter and a, and a small group who have volunteered and, and participation in that group along with the next group, by the way, is open to anybody who's interested and wants to assist us in, in where we're taking our work on your behalf. The second group that we have created um, is led by Stephen Ballasty, who you'll hear from in a moment. And it is about how do we better communicate what we're doing. Uh, this opportunity is a fantastic opportunity for us to reach out to a, a much wider community. But we're very now cognizant of the fact that we need to have a, a proper strategy in place so that we can uh, tell the rest of you in the FM world what we're doing, why we're doing it, what stage we're at, and what we're thinking about doing next. So that is work in progress that we hope to have uh, be launching some aspects of that before the end of this year. On the right-hand side of that table, you can also see that as a technical committee, we reach out to other technical committees who perhaps are um, doing undertaking work in areas the FM might have an interest in or touch on uh, to make sure that we collaborate, that we uh, en encourage comment and, and critique back to us from these other uh, technical committees. And the people's names that are there are the people who volunteered to act as that liaison between our own technical committee and these other ones. And at the bottom of that column, you can also see that we reach out to other interested parties, such as Euro FM and Global FM, as well as the ETUC, which is a European trade union organization who has a, a considerable interest in the progress of, of the services sector across Europe. Uh, just uh, finally, from my uh, uh, introduction, uh, just to explain a little bit about what the, the process is in order to create a standard. For those of you that have never been involved in it, first of all, it's, it's quite a bureaucratic uh, process that we have to go through for all the right reasons. Uh, because if you're going to try and produce something at the end of that process that is internationally applicable and recognizable, then it's very, very important that you follow a very robust process to ensure that uh, everybody, wherever they are in the world, gets adequate opportunity to participate, to critique, to comment, 
so that ultimately uh, we produce something that is usable, applicable, and uh, makes sense internationally as opposed to any particular region or, or country. So the preliminary stages comes from that roadmap type of, of exercise that I spoke about a minute ago, where we decide this is a good topic to uh, try and create an international FM standard on. Uh, that has to go through a proposal process, a documented process to enable uh, all of the ISO participants to comment and agree, disagree, et cetera. And then that uh, iterative process that's highlighted there is the, when we then create that working group. That's the process that they will follow through um, to work and draft and edit uh, can several times um, and a standard document that then goes out for inquiry uh, to the wider world and ultimately approval. And those working groups can, uh, anybody from anywhere through the national standards body is, is able to participate in the work of those working groups. Ultimately, when that working group gets to the final draft international standard, it goes out for uh, public final public comment uh, that will public comment will be received, uh, duly processed, considered, and then we go to, to publication. And typically what then happens is when it leaves us as a committee, it goes into ISO and they do their own editorial. They also do translations, etc. And uh, then suddenly it will become uh, an international standard available to anybody and everybody uh, around the world. So, so ultimately, that is our objective in terms of trying to give ourselves as an FM community some of the tools that will assist us in, in what we do, but also to elevate to the, the outside world and those not directly um, involved in FM to, to have a better understanding that we are applying professional standards in terms of what we do and how we do it as a, as a community and as a discipline. So I'm now going to hand over to Dave Wilson, who's going to take you on the journey about uh, the beginning and, and how far we've come up to 2017. So. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Um, so we're going to talk through, um, as Stan says, what we've done so far. And this slide gives you uh, three things that have, uh, two of them have happened this year, one of them is going to happen this year, um, which are the first three parts of the standard. And I'll talk about each of them um, in due course. But we have three elements here, uh, a vocabulary document, uh, a document on strategic sourcing, um, and then what is uh, known as a technical report, that's ISO 41013, on the concepts and the benefits of facilities management. So um, quite an interesting starting place. Um, as a foundation to where we are going to work towards. So if we talk about um, ISO 41011, which is the vocabulary, and it's, of course, vocabulary is not the most exciting thing to start with, but it's a logical place to start because we can't reach agreement about things like concepts and things like methodologies if we don't all share the same terminology to begin with. So a lot of work was uh, was put into this because all these terms have got to be not only translatable into uh, a variety of languages, as Stan said, but have also got to be conceptually um, understood by people. And it's been interesting that we've come up, uh, as I'm going to expand on, um, at, at least one term, which is, I think, new to the industry. But we also have an international standard definition for facilities management. And if you've been in this industry as long as I've been in it, you'll know that people have been trying to define FM for a very, very long time. And we now have the end, I hope, of that discussion because we have defined collectively over a period of two years facilities management as being an organizational function which integrates people, place, and process within the built environment with the purpose of improving the quality of life of people and the productivity of the core business. Now, those are some really important concepts for us, not just as individuals, but as a profession and an industry, because it's about establishing our place in the world it differentiates us from single services because we're talking about integrating 
it's very specifically about the built environment and it's about doing two outputs for people which are really important so quality of life and productivity and those last two things are something i think which clearly distinguishes facilities management from asset management which is largely about financial outputs so i really hope that the world will adopt with gusto that definition the new concept that we've introduced is a demand organization and that's quite a complex uh, process that we went through if you come from a european or a north american background and you're used to um, outsourcing we quite often talked about clients and contractors and, uh, and suppliers and so on that split um, in terms of responsibilities doesn't work uh, in some uh, cultures and some economies and particularly uh, in asia so what we came up with was to try to distinguish uh, a demand organization which is something which has a need uh, in this case for support services um, and the authority to incur costs to meet that need and that concept actually really proved uh, really useful because it fundamentally underpins almost everything that's going to follow in the re rest of the standards um, that we're going to talk about so it seems a bit artificial but actually it, it describes uh, an activity and a, a relationship which could be within an organization or within between two organizations um, and hopefully that is going to be really useful for people um, the other thing I think that's interesting in here is we have set out a an iteration of um, an organization having a need which it may not even know it has so it can have a an implicit need which has to be turned into a requirement uh, which is uh, specified by somebody and then the organization has to demand it so that's a sort of process and that's going to underpin um, the next standard um, in, in the sweep but I'm not going to talk about the next standard next just to confuse you um, but anyway all this all this vocabulary is about providing a foundation for both uh, the sourcing standard the technical report that's going to come about and finally the management system standard which is where i will get to eventually so um if we look at the next uh, slide this is iso 41013 this what this one isn't published yet it's going to come out later this year this is not a standard um, it is a technical report and it's a technical report because it deals with concepts so it can't provide a norm for doing things it, uh, it, uh, has been extracted and expanded from the original European standards, which is what you can see on the far side. That's the EN 15221-1. Um, so it's an explanation about facilities management. Um, it's not dry facts like the vocabulary is. It's to help people who are new to this, and that can be people moving into facility management as a career. It can be uh, organisational leaders who don't understand what facility management might do for them. Um, it can be uh, companies who want to move into being facilities management companies um, rather than just perhaps a single service provider. So it gives them a conceptual basis and a conceptual explanation um, about what a firm is, how it got to where it is, um, how important processes are to all this, and what the benefits of doing FMR are. I think it's a really, really useful tool for people who are coming to facilities management for the first time. So that's just a very quick overview of, uh, of that technical report, uh, which obviously, because of its technical nature, is a, a little complex to go into today. So the, the result of both those things, if you've understood the vocabulary and you've understood the, um, the fundamental concepts, this is the first um, standard, and it's a guidance standard. Um, you'll see there's a beginning of a, a common structure. So clauses one, two, and three in every standard are the same. But what this one does is it deals with sourcing, not outsourcing. That's to say it's about a process by which organizations can uh, follow a series of steps to move from recognizing the need that they have to providing the services that are required to meet that need. Um, and these, these stages that are set out in these, in these various clauses are uh, very logical, they're very clear, 
and they're very complete so there are examples in here of uh, who you would talk to if you were trying to define what it was the organization and all the other stakeholders within and around an organization what it is they would need to help you define what the services are that support them and there's a series of quite useful almost checklists um, in this document that will take people through this iterative process about how you get from wanting something done to getting it done and in the course of that course you might decide whether you want to provide services are internally or externally but again it's common to all these standards that we don't prescribe solutions we talk about methods and we talk about ways uh, of dealing with this and in some cases we provide quite a lot of examples um, of how things have evolved what practice practical experience people have got so that as Stan said at the beginning in developing economies and new newly emerging businesses or whatever people do not have to start from the basics they can start from this position of having some experience set out for them in a clear relatively concise and logical way so what this does this standard is it takes you through that process right through um, the sourcing by which uh, here we're talking about the decision about how to have services provided um, what you do in terms of agreements and those agreements can be internal so service level internal service level agreements or external they can be formal legal contracts or combinations or any other solution that people need but what needs to go into an agreement how would you express it and how would you measure it now this this document does not go into a great deal of detail about measurement but it provides the link the you know the absolutely essential link between saying you want something done agreeing with somebody that they're going to do it and measuring whether they've done it or not and you can see at the bottom here you have a series of annexes of examples and it's a real strength i think of this uh, suite of documents that we have not just produced a how-to guide but also some explanation um, uh, about what people have done in the past and how you might want to structure some of these things so all that is uh, i think really really necessary and we've got now let's say this is a bit like the first slide so we've set the, uh, the committee up in 2011 we've got the first two standards published now it's 41,011 vocabulary 41,012 guidance on strategic sourcing agreements those are both published about a month ago 41,013 is going to come out later this year and that'll be the technical report so that's where we've got to but the most important thing is still to come and that's the management system standard and the management system standard is equivalent to ISO 9001 but is specifically configured for facility management so it deals with a lot more as we're going to see um, so if you um, love if you can just press the next one we'll get the context thank you um so there are seven parts to the uh, the core of this document and uh, each of these consists of a requirements section this is the things that you are required to do if you want to comply with the standard because it's like 9001 this is going to be an accreditable standard and it will be the first accreditable standard for fm and so the requirement is that you do certain things but those things are processes they're not as i said they're not prescriptive activities and there is uh, an annex for every single one of those that says here's the process that you might want to go through in order to comply with the requirement and the vital thing for us in facilities management is that this starts from the point of the context of the organization and it starts to look at things strategically from the beginning so for all the people who, who think um, that facilities management has lacked strategic clout in the past, this standard, if you adopt it, is going to give you exactly that power um, and that presence um, in the workplace and support the organizations that you serve. Um, so we start with the ex external and internal issues. This says um, we have this concept of interested parties um, most English speakers would use stakeholders, but again, in terms of translation, so on, stakeholders isn't necessarily 
uh, translate particularly well into some other languages. So interesting part is what we said. And it's just a process. And if we go through, through to the, the next stage, thank you, that process has got to be delivered by leaders. So we talk about um, what does leadership mean in the context of a facilities management organisation? To some extent, um, not, in, uh, not prescriptive again, to some extent, what skills are required and what do you do? So to help you translate the context of the organisation into a policy. When you've got a policy, how do you communicate it? How do you make sure that you've got the right people, the right skill set um, to do it? And how have you configured responsibility and authority? And again, so I'll keep repeating this because people have a, a misconception. We don't tell you what responsibility to give people. We just say go through a process to work out who is competent, how are you going to delegate authority, how are you going to know when they've done their job. That then transla translates into planning. So all the detailed stuff that you need to do in the background before you even begin to deliver the services. Um, and, you know, again, the idea is, as with 9001, if you don't do the groundwork, you don't have a plan, you won't deliver the outputs that you want. So lots and lots of stuff in here about how to address risks, um, how to make sure you express the requirement of stakeholders properly, what your objectives are, how you have an implementation plan, how you make sure that you've looked to the future and you've understood how long it takes between deciding to do something and it actually happening. So all those are in, are in there. Next one. Yeah, thanks. Then we start to get down to some detail about, well, what is the support that's required to make that happen? How do we secure the resources, both financially um, and in terms of skill sets? How do we monitor them? And some of that goes back to the previous standard 41,012. Um, what are the competencies? How do we communicate everything that's going on? Because doing things in isolation has long been a weakness of FM, though it's been internal looking. This is about making sure that it becomes external looking, that it's engaged with its customers, that it's engaged with its stakeholders, and specifically with the demand organisation at the end of the day of funding all this. And what information is required to make sure that everybody knows what is happening. And then we finally get to the bit which most people are focused on in FM, which is the operations bit. And so we talk about operational processes. How do we change? How do we control change in those processes? You know, are there feedback loops? How do we make sure the feedback loops are valid? Um, customer relationship management. You know, and I've said for a long time that FM is a customer service business. How do we make sure that those relationships are managed and understood properly? How do we integrate all the diversity of support services to try and get to the right outcome? And then how do we evaluate it? You know, we, no point in doing all this if we don't understand. So there's a whole uh, series of uh, steps in there about gathering information, managing information, um, feeding it back into both the demand organization and the facilities management organization, and acting on the results of that evaluation. And then finally, the service improvement. How do, we, how do we stop things going wrong? How do we know when they've gone wrong? Um, what do we do to try and make sure that we continually improve the services that we give? So if you look at that as a structure, I think that that is a really coherent um, you know, flow of process. And as I say, every single one of those areas is supported by quite copious guidance um, on the issue of FM. So, um, there we are, that's where we're getting to. I think now I'm going to hand over to Stephen. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> I touched the screen and it went away. So, Laverne, where are you? 
Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, which slide did you? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Technical difficulties. Okay, so how to participate? Well, as you've heard from uh, my fellow presenters, Stan and uh, Dave, this has been one hell of a effort over several years of teamwork. 25 participating countries, 17 observing, that's 42 in all. And, but at the end of the day, it's you, those who are in FM who are our greatest uh, ambassadors and advocates. And certainly in my experience, the strongest ambassadors you can have are those who have the most to gain. Uh, equally, those who have the most to lose. Uh, the stakes are high when it comes to an ISO standard like this. So uh, next slide, Laverne. Thank you. So my role here in this presentation is the call to action, how to get involved, uh, literally on the journey of your FM lifetime. Uh, it's not understating it to say that this is a game changer. Uh, the four steps on our call to action is about review, connecting, critiquing and submitting, get involved. So the review is all about engagement. This material is now out there, it's live. It's not something that's coming, it's arrived. So familiarize yourself with the material around 41,000. I am not on mute. No, we can hear you, Stephen. Oh, good. You can hear me. Good. Oh, sorry, I thought I got a, a mute signal. Uh, so, connecting. There's a link. There's a link there on that connect uh, signpost. That will connect you with your country contacts. There are 163 country contacts uh, at the other end of that link. So, there's a that which is of course even more than the countries involved. The critique we look for is feedback. Uh, it's really your opportunity to make a difference. And I can't uh, underestimate, I can't um, underestimate the importance of getting as much feedback as possible. And the best way to get your feedback uh, in the system is to provide uh, not only what you like and what you don't like about the material, but also give reason, give creative uh, feedback or constructive feedback in such a way that uh, the committee will not only know what you would like changed or what you like about it, but why. Reasoning is very important to the ISO process. Uh, this comes back through your national standards bodies. Uh, and ultimately, the, the reward of this process for you as a profession and an FM industry worldwide will be a robust, relevant and long lasting standard. Next slide, please. Levan. So the road to publication, uh, reminding you all that, yes, just in the past month, we've seen two of the fruits of our labours come out. Uh, in terms of 41,011, the vocabulary, and the 41,012, the guidance for strategic sourcing and agreements. And that will be closely followed by 41,013 for scope, key concepts and benefits. But now it really gets interesting, as I think Dave said, uh, as we move into to the work of Working Group 3, which is charged with producing a management system standard with guidance. This will be our 41,001. The national standards bodies, these are the groups that at your national level are recognised. Yes, you can uh, engage through industry bodies and indeed promote the existence of 41,000 uh, suite of standards to your industry bodies, both FM and non-FM alike. There are many allied bodies out there. But ultimately, the feedback that we, we seek comes back through your national standard body. Uh, your countries 
of um, origin in terms of your national standards bodies will have what are known as mirror committees. This is your voice in the ISO process. So feedback to the ultimately to ISO TC267 is of critical importance. Uh, we outlined the program before. This is all happening real time. Uh, and the value of a management system standard, as Dave was saying, will be the ability to be audited and ultimately accredited, the ability to accredit organisations. This provides FM with tremendous credibility, something we've never had or are likely to get again. That's why I talk about it as being the journey of your FM lifetime. Next slide, please, Laverne. Stan mentioned that uh, this year we've established two new task groups. The first one, the, the FM roadmap, is really looking at the way through the complexity of FM and how to use the ISO 41000 suite uh, of international standards. But also, what next? Where to? How do we continue to, uh, to challenge not just FM, but also those who are the ultimate consumers of the service. And then there's the communication strategy, the task group that I've been charged with. Uh, this task group is currently drawing from volunteers from Australia, Korea, the Netherlands, UK and the US. So making for a truly international um, range of thought, but there is always room for more. So I see that group broadening. Uh, simplistically, the task group is charged with three roles or three objectives. Firstly, to promote awareness and the adoption of 41,000. There's no point in having a standard if we don't engage with it and adopt it. How do we do this? That's the second objective, through consistent messaging and multiple outreaches and modes of uh, communication uh, through the media, through conferences, through publications, through getting people to talk about 41,000. Uh, and the third objective is to facilitate greater collaboration, not just within the, uh, the FM world, but between uh, ISO TC 267 uh, and other ISO standards, which are related to FM. It's a, going to be a massive outreach program. Next slide, please, Laverne. So, Oscar Wilde, he was talking about the success is a science. If you have the conditions, you get the result. I think what he was trying to say is that there's value in a system. And the ISO 41000 suite of standards will provide our profession with an unprecedented opportunity to get that result. So perhaps if uh, Oscar Wilde was really asking a question, he'd be asking, what will your contribution be to a more productive, sustainable and livable built environment for all? Uh, you need to see the, the value in having a standard and but having it and using it so think of ways that your organization can support this effort and feedback to the people on this call and to your national standards bodies your local fm uh, industry associations and allied bodies uh, that's the challenge ladies and gentlemen uh, to get involved. Thank you, and that brings us to Q&A. Okay, okay. Uh, please, uh, we will uh, ask in, 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 in the questions in, inside of the chat. And then we we can we can pass for the presenters. Uh, uh, there, uh, I have a question. I have a question about uh, the work group three, and what's the due date 
for the comments worldwide uh, for this review and to get ready for next year uh, publication of the the ISO 41001. So this is Laverne um, Deckard. I, I work for IFMA, and if anyone has any questions, they can certainly contact me at IFMA standards at, at ifma.org. The due date is going to be dependent, Ricardo, on your national standards body. Every national standards body should have um, made an announcement that this, this is out for public comment. Um, in the U.S., I know that due date for public comment is June the 30th, and what that allows is the working groups, the, the mirror committees in each country to get back that information from other stakeholders and review that information, and what we're charged with is to develop a consensus position from each of our countries so that when we go to that meeting in September in Kuala Lumpur, we'll be able to present our country's position and, and place a vote. The vote for each country is actually due August the 1st um, of this year. So that, that's that's uh, the position for the, Ju the June voting date deadline. Okay, I ask you this because here in Brazil, the Brazilian Association of Facilities is a start to work now. And then, uh, uh, start the discussions uh, with uh, the national board for ISO here. It's uh, ABNT, and then uh, this is the the question. My my question because this is uh, today is May, is almost uh, May, and we start the discussion. Yeah, and it's perfect timing. And so um, your what you'll do is have that. Uh, discussion to your mirror committee, your your results and your comments, um, you know, so that if they're, a, I don't recall that Brazil is a P member, a participating member, but we want those comments certainly before our meeting. Um, we do try and involve all comments, but definitely before um, June, July, if you're voting, if your country's voting, they need to have that vote in by August 1. It, it, it's a good stand here. Um, it's a good point that uh, Brazil, as it happens, is not a participating country. Um, but we do encourage where a mirror uh, committee doesn't exist for uh, the local associations, etc., to get together and to uh, collaborate their input. If you need any assistance or help in how to go about that and make sure that that information comes back to us as a TC, uh, please reach out to us and we'll give you all the information that you need. Okay, thank you. Right, and I, I, I do believe if your country is not able to um, form a position uh, or a group at this time, I know that there's Aberfac there in Brazil um, and other countries if you have FM organizations, they can actually form a liaison um, group as well to RTC. So we can speak about that as well if, if that's, you know, the, the method for you to get involved. Okay, there is a question here. Is this just possible to volunteer through the minor committees even for the communication strategy? It's Clara from Spain. Uh, yes, and Stan again. In terms of the the task groups, if that's what the question is referring to, uh, we are more than happy in welcoming anybody who wants to try and participate in that process. Uh, we have, in the uh, initial period of pulling that together, already identified the need to get some people involved who potentially can translate uh, to the local language. And uh, we've already identified uh, people that are going to assist the group in terms of Spanish and French. Uh, but we're more than happy if other people would like to support us in, in that regard uh, to get in touch with us. And we'll link them into the communication task group. Well. Okay, I think uh, no more questions right now. Um, Levin, please, can you can you change the slide?
sorry, I can I just say I gave you back the presenter role if you want to move your slide there. Sorry, I could have changed it. Then. OK, no problem. OK, this is our next uh, next webinar, our mega sections is uh, the, the next will be from Nigeria. Uh, is terrorism is our FM plan, and and the next will be Rix uh, Victors, our change in the world, and is uh, the other in Germany and Canada making more effective business in this case to C suite, and uh, others that we can check in our uh, program in our site. Uh, you can make uh, stay connected with us with our mobile app it's uh, it's it's available for iphone and android uh, cell phones as again uh, volunteers for if my fmcc are always welcome we uh, we have uh, need volunteers for webinar presentation web papers walter podcast pressman and you can you can you can see uh, that you can have a coordinator, supporter, and social media activist. You can contact by me and this uh, in, uh, that I am in chair, stack chair for this, this comment. All other information about our site fm fmcc slash uh, world workplace dot com. If I'm, uh, this is all this, uh, the if my councils and committee that we have for to understand more the for if if a uh, if my world thank you for joining us and uh, please take a moment for a brief survey in the conclusion of this webinar have a great day for everybody thank you very much